So again, I'm Brian Lacey. I'm from Dartmouth in New Hampshire, where we had our, I think, our last snowstorm last week. So it's nice to see a lot of green territory. I'm going to start with a quick case. And again, we want to make this as interactive as possible. Please feel free to raise your hands, send us questions. Uh, I know you guys have had a busy day. You've heard lectures all day. You don't need three talking heads up here. Make sure we answer your questions. So this is one of my patients. I focus on IBS and other functional bowel disorders. Uh, this is a 29-year-old biologist sent for management of her symptoms of IBS with diarrhea, I think a third opinion. Her symptoms developed several years ago, about eight years ago in college. She was down in Mexico doing some research. She had a prolonged bout of diarrhea in Mexico, and symptoms have really not just persisted but progressed since that time. Pretty predictably, every day, four to five loose, watery, urgent, bloody bowel movements. She knows every bathroom along 91 in Vermont. Uh, she goes to work from home to work. Uh, she describes a lot of gas and bloating. Sometimes she feels like she looks pregnant. Bloating, remember, is a sensory disorder. Distension is the physical manifestation. She has pain at least a day per week. It's transiently relieved by having a bowel movement, but then the pain comes back. And as Dr. Talley mentioned, the uh, pain can be anywhere in the abdomen, but usually in the lower abdomen. Her weight has remained stable despite these symptoms for eight years. Any laboratory test you can imagine has probably been performed and has been normal. She was part of a research study a couple of years ago. She had a full colonoscopy to the TI. Random biopsies were completely, utterly normal. And she's tried a number of different medications, probably like a lot of your patients. Over-the-counter Imodium did not help. She tried cholestyramine, didn't like the taste, but didn't help anyways. She used a smooth muscle antispasmodic dicyclamine and also used a tricyclic at about 50 to 60 milligrams a night without any benefit at all. Her medical history is otherwise unremarkable. She's not allergic to anything. She's on an oral contraceptive. Her one surgery was an appendectomy years ago. She works as a high school biology teacher. She's very reasonable. She's just looking for some help. Doesn't smoke, occasionally has a drink. Uh, mother has IBS. Interesting, we spoke about a genetic predisposition before and maybe some insult, such as an infectious diarrhea. No family member with IBD or celiac disease. That's what we're kind of thinking about, warning signs, and she doesn't have them. So she really comes to be informed. Um, we can discuss whether or not the diagnosis is in doubt. I'm going to ask you just in a second, does she really have IBS? But she has three key questions she wants me to answer. One is, could bacterial overgrowth be the cause of her symptoms? And should she be tested for bacterial overgrowth? She wants to know about diets. Diets are all the rage. What dietary intervention out, uh, intervention out there? And she's a biologist. She wants to know this in a reasonable, data-driven fashion. And she asks whether or not antibiotics might help, and is she a candidate? So before we go on, IBS or not? IBS or, we're looking around, sorry, the lights are looked bright. Pretty confident with the diagnosis? OK. And we're confident because we are thinking about the Rome 4 criteria, meaning that Nick has already gone through this, but she has abdominal pain at least a day per week. And her symptoms are frequently related to defecation. Oftentimes, they're worsened by having a bowel movement. But keep in mind, so there's a chronicity of symptoms. My standard line is, I'm so sorry, you've had these symptoms for eight or 10 years. To me, that's incredibly reassuring. Bad things in the GI tract don't linger for 10 years like this. They march on. So that's very reassuring. She meets Rome criteria. She does not have any warning signs on history. And the examination, by the way, is helpful for two reasons. Examine the patient. Don't just gloss over that. One, you're looking for things. Does she have ascites? Does she have a big liver? Does she have a tender spleen? Is there another organic cause that could be the problem? But also that physical exam is reassuring to the patient. You're listening. You're taking them seriously. Don't forget, patients come to see you for four reasons, right? They want you to listen. Don't cut them off after 18 seconds, the average physician, even busy GI doctors. Number two, they want you to really hear their story. Listen. They want to be reassured. They want to be educated. And of course, they want to feel better. So I think we all agree. This is not a trick. She has IBS with diarrhea. And then the question is, does she have bacterial overgrowth? And Baha, should we test her? Should we do a breath hydrogen test? and test her for bacterial overgrowth, or possibly even come back to treating her empirically. We'll maybe discuss that later. Sure. I mean, with this diagnosis, I think we're pretty confident that it is irritable bowel syndrome. Bacterial overgrowth syndrome has a lot of controversy surrounding it um, because the form that we have that we test patients with is breath testing. Um, that's not available in most places. And breath testing, breath testing itself is not very sensitive. Um, there are patients that 
just because of the nature of the fact that they have diarrhea, will have this rapid transit and will have elevation in methane and hydrogen. And that's because it's a tr more of a transit study. So we're really detecting colonic. So it has a very high false positive rate. So at this point, I think breath testing is not warranted um, for, the, for those reasons. Okay, and we could do another kind of, who here orders breath tests for IBS? Okay, so a very knowledgeable crowd. A lot of us would argue, one, you may have colonic dysbiosis, not bacterial overgrowth. But number two, let's say somebody does. How are you gonna treat them? You may end up treating them the exact same way. So a lot of us really don't believe that breath testing is necessary for most patients. And by the way, the test is not, as that Baja pointed out, not a great test. Okay, so we're gonna move on from there. And then she wanted to talk about diets. So there are many different diets that have been recommended or tested uh, for the treatment of IBS. I wanna focus on the bottom two because these are really the most topical. And unless you've been on a desert island for the last 10 years, I know your patients are coming to see you and they're asking, should I be on a low gluten diet? Should I be on a low FODMAP diet? So this is kind of one of my patients. If you can't read this, it says, I have no idea what gluten is either, but I'm <laughs> avoiding it just to be safe, okay? I mean, how many of your patients now come in on a gluten-free diet for whatever reason? I'm not quite sure. So let's look at the data. So there are a couple of interesting studies. I'm going to focus on two interesting studies. This is a very nice one by Vizikersky and colleagues, published about five years ago now, and it's really stood the test of time. And this is really one of the first diet uh, treatments out there. This is a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled, re-challenge study. This is very methodologically sound. There are 34 patients who met Rome 3 criteria for IBS. Celiac disease was carefully excluded both serologically and endoscopically with biopsies. They had all noted a prior uh, improvement in symptoms on a gluten-free diet. They were then randomized to either a gluten-containing diet or something that looked like gluten but did not contain gluten. And the primary endpoint was adequate symptom relief. We could debate is that the best endpoint, but the FDA was accepting it back then. And what was noted was that the gluten group had less improvement in symptoms than those on a gluten-free diet. And this is a nice slide here point out that those randomized to gluten shown in red had more pain, more bloating, uh, less satisfaction with stool consistency, and more fatigue than those on a gluten-free diet shown in blue. And you'll hear many of your patients with either celiac or IBS or diarrhea on a gluten-free diet say, I have more energy. And sometimes that mental fog seems to feel better, although I can't explain why that is. This is followed by a very nicely designed study by Vasquez, Roque, and colleagues at the Mayo Clinic, published just two years ago in gastroenterology. And they took 45 patients with IBSD only. The other trial had all IBS subtypes, just IBSD, predominantly women, again, randomized to a gluten-free diet or gluten-containing diet. An incredibly thorough study involving multiple specialty tests that most of us don't, perf don't perform. What was really interesting, though, is in this study, they measured intestinal permeability. And what they found was that those on a gluten diet had increased small bowel permeability, but also a worsening of symptoms. And as Dr. Talley alluded to earlier, I think we're now starting to get a little bit of a really neat story about why this might work. And so if we went back to that slide he showed, you could imagine that in some people with a genetic predisposition, maybe a prior insult like an infectious diarrhea, where those tight junctions might be a little permeable anyways, you now add in gluten, it opens up those tight junctions, things can trickle through from the gut lumen towards the barrier there with the nerves and blood vessels, inflammation occurs, and this downstream reaction occurs, mast cells are activated, mast cell chemicals are released, and this inflammatory reaction occurs, and symptoms develop. It's really a nice story now, so I think we've learned a lot in the last few years. What about a low FODMAP diet? Dr. Talley already covered this. Again, if you haven't seen this before, it's just nice to refresh yourself. And what was pointed out is this is a difficult diet to do. And if you've never tried it, do it for a weekend. It's very difficult, although many patients, about 50 to 60% feel better at the start. The real question then is if you're placed on this low FODMAP diet, what is there left to eat? That should really be the question your patients ask you. So I tell my patients lean proteins, illustrated here, gluten-free products, white rice instead of maybe whole wheat, corn products, quinoa are safe, and there are some safe fruits and vegetables. Now, what's the data to support this? So this is one of the first studies published about five years ago 
looking at 82 consecutive IBS patients using the European criteria, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, uh, which is kind of like the NIH, more or less, in Europe. And there were 82 patients had a very thorough and thoughtful evaluation with dietitians playing an intimate role here. Don't forget, dietary trials are very difficult to perform. And when you provide the meals, they're very expensive to perform as well. 39 patients remain in what they consider their standard European diet. 42 were randomized to a low FODMAP diet group. And what's shown here is that generally those randomized to the low FODMAP diet in blue felt better. I'm sorry, we lost the x-axis here. I apologize. That was cut out somewhere in the editing. But they felt better in terms of global IBS symptoms. They felt better in terms of pain. They felt better in terms of bloating and distension. What was interesting was there wasn't a dramatic change in stool consistency. Interesting. But overall, patients felt better. And this is kind of the first hint that maybe this diet was a good one. By the way, if, if you know your FODMAP trivia, this was actually developed in Australia nearly 30 years ago, primarily for IBD patients. It's been translated to the IBS field. This is a study published just two years ago, again in gastroenterology, probably one of the best GI journals in the world. 30 IBS patients, Rome 3 criteria, and eight healthy controls. Notice the small numbers. These are difficult studies to perform. This is done in Australia uh, by Peter Gibson. He was a senior author, uh, where they were randomized to 21 days of a low FODMAP diet or 21 days of a typical Australian diet. We could ask Nick exactly what that is, because I don't know in New Hampshire. Uh, so keep in mind, would this apply to your patients in your community? Um, it was a crossover design. You have to think, is there some bias there? All what the, although what the authors mentioned was symptoms had to return to baseline before they went on to the next diet. So a crossover does influence stuff. If you remember the slide that Nick showed a couple minutes ago, when you introduce a new diet, the gut microbiome can change within two to four days. Your gut microbiome is incredibly responsive to changes in diet, and it's from this meal, it's already changing. If it's, this is a different meal than you eat at home. Okay, they measured stool symptoms, stool frequency, and water content, and once again, what they found was that patients randomized so the low FODMAP diet felt better in terms of overall IBS symptoms than those on a typical Australian diet, and specifically, gas, bloating, pain, and stool consistency were all improved. So this might be a reasonable thing for this patient, but there are some problems with this diet. This is not a magical diet. If you start doing an internet search or a Google search, you're going to find that there are tons of different FODMAP diets out there. They all seem to differ a little bit in terms of what foods are on the diet, what values are accorded to in terms of FODMAP content. Do you count the FODMAPs at each meal or throughout the course of the day? And as Nick alluded to, this is a hard diet and sometimes an expensive diet to follow. And there are some theoretical concerns that long-term use, and I mean years, could actually be injurious, maybe B12 deficiency, calcium problems, phosphorus so problems, So, Brian, we have a question about this um, yeah. from the audience. How many days um, do you usually use the FODMAP diet for your patients? How many days do you tell them to do it, and then how do we reintroduce the food? Yeah, so it'd be interesting. We could ask how we all do it. I say four weeks. I want people to do a month hoping they do two weeks. Okay, so I'm asking for a month, and then the key is we ask them to start reintroducing foods. I don't know. And Baja. a week at a time? Is that how you do it? No, I do it all at once. So I want yeah. everybody to do the complete file map. Oh, and then but introduce the reintroduction. Foods. Yes. And okay, then start choosing right. other safe foods, carrots, green beans, et cetera, and introduce them. I do it every couple of days because otherwise it goes on forever. Yeah, I usually do the same. I usually do either two weeks or you know a month if I think they can they okay. can really do it, depending on the patient. And then I have them introduce the foods that they want to eat <laughs> one by one. Like yep. for a week. So if there's something on the list that they really want, like garlic or whatever ingredient, I have them add one at a time per week and then see if that causes symptoms, then obviously they have to avoid it. That's great. Now an alternative, and Nick, out of curious, how do you do it? No, I do it similarly. And I must say, it's, it, we, we have to get a nutritionist to help us typically because uh, most of our patients don't do it terribly well. Right. So you're in private practice. I'm spoiled. Um, I actually get an hour for new patient evaluation. That's shocking, I know. Most of mine are third or fourth opinions. If you're seeing 15 patients for a morning session as primary care providers, we get how busy you are. 
you can't spend half an hour on a diet. And this is where you really need to have a dietitian who's excited and interested and motivated. You could spend your whole 20-minute visit, if you want, on that one diet, but that's all you're going to accomplish that day. And we know you've got to ask about cholesterol and safe sex and seat belts and everything else, too. It's, it's hard to accomplish, isn't it? So get a dietitian who's really interested and motivated and who can help you out with this. And what about FODMAP versus gluten-free? Like, when do you use the gluten-free versus the FODMAP? Great question. And so the, the world's literature is zero. We don't know. We, this is really an emerging field. What we need is great data to say, let's randomize somebody to a standard diet, low gluten, low FODMAP. That's not been done yet. And who would respond better? We don't know who would respond better. So that's a great research study out there. I think if people are very concerned about gluten, as many people are, um, that maybe is less intrusive than a low FODMAP diet. So if you think they may not adhere to the low FODMAP diet. Maybe choose the low gluten diet first. Don't forget, for a lot of FODMAP diets, what's also excluded? Gluten. So there's a lot of overlap there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So this might be a very reasonable thing for this patient who's knowledgeable and motivated, but I, we try to give them data, low gluten or low FODMAP. And then she asked about, am I a, a, a person who might receive an antibiotic? Might antibiotics help me, and we already kind of spoke about the fact that most patients don't have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO. They may have colonic dysbiosis, an alteration in your gut flora. My typical lecture to the patients is, you have about four pounds of bacteria in your colon. You have 1,000 to 2,000 species. You have more living cells in your colon than in your entire body combined. That can be upset. That incredibly delicate balance can be easily upset. And the concept of the antibiotic is it may get that delicate balance back in sync. However, we talked about colonic dysbiosis. It has other possible mechanisms. It may change the way the bacteria act on the immune system. That's one possibility. It may act more as an anti-inflammatory agent. There are a lot of really interesting theories about how rifaximin might work. We mentioned rifaximin because it is a gut-directed antibiotic. Less than 1% is absorbed. It's been the most studied antibiotic for IBS, but one cautionary note uh, comes up is, can we take this data for rifaximin, the target one or target two study published in the New England Journal, the target three study will be out later this year. Can you take that? information and translate it to other antibiotics such as Flagyl or Cipro? And the answer is absolutely not. So don't walk away and start saying, I'm going to treat all my IBSD patients with an antibiotic. They're not the same. Rifaximin is the best study. And this is, I briefly mentioned the Target 1 and Target 2 study published in the New England Journal five years ago. I'm sure you're familiar with this data. Nick has already shown this. And then this very complicated Target 3 study. I'll briefly mention this just because it's kind of interesting. When the company went to, before the FDA, they were not concerned so much about the efficacy. They were okay with the efficacy, but they were worried about patients being retreated because this is an antibiotic. As Dr. Talley mentioned, many patients treated feel better two, three, four months off any medication. It's the only drug in IBS history shown to do that. So this study is fascinating. If you look on the left-hand side, everybody ran, who came into the study, there were nearly 3,000 people, anybody who came to the study got placebo. Placebo up front, everybody got placebo. We were part of the study. And if you, were, if you responded, you were out of the study. So placebo responders were pulled out of the study. Then if you didn't respond, you still had your IBS symptoms, everybody got rifaximin. So this study was not designed necessarily for efficacy, it was designed for safety. So everybody got rifaximin up front, 550 TID for two weeks, and then you were followed. And when symptoms relapsed, you got a second dose, and if they relapsed again, you got a third treatment. That's the design of the study. Is it safe and also effective over time? And the answer would be yes. What we saw kind of mimics target one and target two. To me, that's incredibly reassuring. But I want to point out one interest, two facts. One is we saw the response rate about 42%, almost mimics the larger study involving 2,400 people. But also, a third of patients never relapsed. To me, that's really interesting. You gave them a two-week medical intervention, and none of their symptoms over the next 18 weeks, 24, uh, 24 weeks, came back. That's fascinating. That's never been shown in IBS history. So is this patient a candidate for an antibiotic? Possibly, and this might be a reasonable one. 